relationship to men and their relationship to women of color. Um, our next panelist is Sarah Green, and Sarah is an intern at the Pensacola Unitarian Universalist Fellowship, and she also um, has done a good bit of academic work on feminism, uh, womanism, and issues with women of color. So let's welcome Sarah Green. I knew I was sitting down, but um, I can't do that. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I, yeah <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of an update on, on where womanism has gone. So it started with Alice Walker, um, and then interestingly enough, because um, of the experience of mostly Southern black women involving um, church, uh, theologians um, in seminaries and divinity schools have, have picked it up and really developed it into something really, really beautiful. Um, and like feminism, there have been waves, and like feminism, there have been flaws. Um, and the work is still really um, incredibly valuable and useful, um, especially when looking at the Women's March. And just, um, if we had to do it over again, what would that look like? And so uh, at Vanderbilt, where I went to grad school, um, I studied with Stacy Floyd Thomas, who's a womanist ethicist. Um, so there are like theologians that deal more deeply with you know who God is and uh, according to the realities of black women. But but Stacy, um, Dr. Floyd Thomas, deals explicitly with. Um, how does this inform our actions and how we move through the world? So, you know, about um, what are we going to do about it? Um, and so, in her work, she uh, this is a book, Mining the Mother Load. In the in Mining the Mother Load, she's come up with four tenets of womanism. So we've got the definition from Alice Walker, which is really beautiful and like um, felt like a prayer when you read it. So thank you for that. Um, and people have added language and um, methodology um, to, to this corpus of, of work. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but if, if some folks are still stuck on what um, folks have said before and maybe need some references, some books, uh, if that's how your mind works, I would encourage you to first decolonize that notion. And B, I got some books for you to read if that's how you're your mind works. So Negroes with Guns would be one that talks explicitly about um, the role of violence and, this, and the civil rights movement um, and goes deep, in, I think, into the Deacons of Defense, which protected Martin Luther King as he was um, unarmed walking through the South. The Deacons of Defense were there armed, being like, that's cute. <laughs> that's cute. I'm, I'm glad we want you to be safe and live in your values, and we don't want you to die. So we're going to accompany you uh, through this land. Um, and then Women, Race, and Class by Angela Davis. It's a pretty thorough um, account of the history. Okay. Um, and I'm going to try not to talk. Um, this is what I'm, I think this, me working this out is more about like us and less about like um, focus, less about centering whiteness again. So um, yeah. It's about honoring uh, the work that's been done before us and bringing that into the room. So the four tenets are traditional communalism, radical subjectivity, redemptive self-love, and critical engagement. And so traditional communalism talks about um, taking the past and present to define our future. It talks a lot about remembering um, and paying homage to what has gotten black women here thus far. What have been um, the tools that have supported black women in their quest for liberation. And so um, if this value of remembering and, 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 and community um, was deeply lived out in the Women's March, it would have looked like a few different things. It would have looked like black women in the front and not just standing in the front, but at the center of, um, I'll repeat this probably a few times, but the center of the demands um, 
It would have looked like economic support for women of color's work. Um, it would have looked like incorporating more spirit and song from the traditions of black women. It would have looked like um, explicit recognition of the politics of respectability, which for those who have not heard that term or the, uh, the history of that term, was created by Southern Baptist women um, as a tactic and not a philosophy of life. Very, really key um, distinction. Uh, radical subjectivity is about affirming authentic selfhood and having the freedom and space to define themselves in and of their own right, not as a response. So if white women go away, I'm still a black woman. And that is, that is valid. I'm not um, constantly defined in relationship to um, something else. And so if this value were to be deeply lived out in the Women's March, it would have looked like black trans women in the center. Maybe we would have gotten ring, rid of the pink pussy hats um, because not all women have pussies and they're not all pink. Um, it would have looked like calling out patterns of patriarchy, misogyny, sexism, transphobia before the current administration and lifting up the work that's been done um, in direct response to, to those things uh, before, during, and after that have helped shape what we know as reality right now. Our, our analysis is, is on the backs of women um, and, and, and folks who have, done, who have been doing the work for a very, very long time. Redemptive self-love talks about self-love and acceptance. And it's about women coming to spaces to be rejuvenated. And it's about the movement of the spirit and uh, the embodiment of the spirit that allows black women to liberate themselves. Ooh, that was, I wrote that um, uh, verbatim from the text because I just thought it was so beautiful. Um, this would have looked like finding new symbols and new heroes that represent the most marginalized going back to the suffragette movement. It would have looked like affirming the definitions and demands regarding liberation by women of color and would have meant affirming black women's agency and rage. Celebrating, actually, black women's agency and rage. And then the last one, critical engagement, um, is about embracing dynamic tensions. It's about inclusivity and pluralism and messiness and being the, 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 the cutting, on the cutting edge um, of the movement. It's about like, being, um, we call it the prophetic voice, um, speaking truth to power, saying what saying um, would exist and has not yet been named. Um, and it's about uh, acknowledging how um, fruitful it can be to engage in moral tensions, to talk about what's right and what's wrong, to dare to say, um, this is where I see evil in the world, um, and not say, oh, well, um, we can all be right. Too much, is, too much is really on the line for that sort of um, nonsense. So this would have looked like uh, transparency and inclusion during the planning of the, of the, um, of the march um, from the beginning, from its inception. Actually, it probably shouldn't have happened unless a, a woman of color suggested that it happened. It would have looked like wrestling with the experiences and showing up for black trans women. It would have looked like acknowledging indigenous women and starting the march with um, a ceremony about being on stolen land. And it would have also looked like an analysis of um, nonviolence in the case of protests. Why is it that we were allowed to have um, a nonviolent um, protest and others have not been? So I don't want to take up too much time. I really want to get to other folks and questions. But um, I think that these values are really, really critical to shaping how we move forward. And you know, they're values to live deeply into, not a checklist, right? And so um, it'll be critical as we, as we continue to build together in this room, um, trying, practicing, failing, living into the messiness, and coming back to um, the values that ground us, whether we, you know, 
stick with these or, or the others. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what I got. Thank you.